scripture reading from today will come from Luke chapter 23, oh, Luke chapter 9, verses 23 through 27. And it reads, Then he said to them all, If anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. For whoever desires to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. For what profit is it to a man if he gains the whole world is in, and is himself destroyed or lost. For whoever is ashamed of me and my words, of him the Son of Man will be ashamed when he comes in his own glory and his Father's and of the holy angels. But I tell you truly, there are some standing here who shall not taste death till they see the kingdom of God. Thank you, Josiah. It's great to see everyone this morning. Amen. Being able to praise God is always such a joy, and it's good to see more and more of you back here. Um, what a great thing it is to be able to have people around again and uh, being able to see each other at least, shake, hug. <laughs> I know, it'll get better, but uh, that's where we are for this morning. So there are some things that Jesus has to say that are just difficult. Uh, we don't need to try and avoid those. I think we need to understand those and maybe focus on those a little bit. And so when we've been talking about conforming to the heart of Jesus, uh, I guess we need to deal with some of the harder things too. And this passage that has been read to us this morning is, is maybe one of the most difficult that we face because he has just been talking about his cross and the fact that he's going to a cross and what do we do with that? How do we handle that? And before we get a chance to really understand what he's talking about at his cross, he says, if you're going to follow me, you're going to have a cross. And so, wait a second, now we've got a cross and so as you look at this passage, it's one of those amazing things. What does it mean to choose sides, to choose Jesus? Uh, it might be as simple as, you know, well, I, I, I think there is a Jesus. Well, it's a little bit more complicated than that. We can make it real complex and, and go into all the different doctrines about death and resurrection and who Jesus is and the Godhead and the Trinity and all of those things. But it actually might be just as simple as where you sit on Sunday morning and how did you get here and why are you here and whether you're sitting here or sitting there at home, you're worshiping and you're, you're trying to participate with God and you're saying that that's what's important to you. And so as you look at this passage that he talks about, he talks about Jesus is going to be crucified and then we're going to have to choose. And he says, I want you to follow. And in order to follow, it involves the first thing is deny yourself. You've got to be able to get rid of self. That's a concept that is foreign to Americans. We don't deny ourselves of anything. We want to have everything and we want it on sale. I mean, that's just the way it is. There's got to be some kind of a discount that goes with it because nobody wants to pay full price. And so we approach Jesus that way sometimes. What are the benefits that I get out of Christianity? What are you going to give me? How can I get everything out of Christianity that it could possibly give me? And Jesus turns and says, fine, I'll give you a cross. And that doesn't come on sale. We need to be able to deny ourselves. We need to be able to say, I'm going to choose Jesus and not myself. Some things we stay away from and we avoid those things because they're sin. They're just out and out wrong and we understand that and so we're going to stay away from those things. But some things are not so much wrong as they are not helpful and we need to avoid some things there where we're going to realize we might be in a situation where we no longer have control. 
And to choose Jesus and not ourself means we're going to choose some things that maybe we don't want because they're going to be what's best for Jesus and they're not going to be what's best for us. And so we decide to do something that's good for Jesus and for him and for the things that he wants most of all. Well, that's hard for us, I think, just being able to make that kind of a choice. What he says is take up your cross. That's the way to deal with it, to take up your cross. And then he says, take up your cross daily. Well, that's pretty hard. Every day? I thought it was take up your cross one time, and then we'll do some big thing for him. And no, he says, take up your cross every single day. You're going to pick it up, and you're going to carry it, and realize this is the place where I'm ready. I'm ready to end it. And so we carry with us the place where we say, you know what, I'm ready at any time. This is the time to die. And we die to ourselves. We don't try and control the desire. We don't try and control the sin. Let me sin a little bit whiter or a little bit less or a little bit, you know, simpler or something like that. No, that's not what we're doing. It's a battle with ourself. And he says the best way to deal with that is to die. Not make yourself want less, but to die. And it's the only way. Because otherwise, we keep coming back. I saw this. You either die a hero or you live long enough to see yourself become the villain. We live long enough to see what sin does in our life, and we realize we're at fault. We're the cause. We're the one. We're the problem. And we either give our life to Jesus and let him cleanse us and let him redeem us and let him do something with us, or we live long enough to be the problem. And so the result, he says, is lose yourself to deny yourself, to give up on yourself? What profit does it have that you're trying to get if you lose your soul? And all the things we work for and all the things that we try to gain don't make a difference. No matter how much you gain, it isn't worth it. Who we are in Christ is so much bigger than anything else. And so he also says, don't let yourself be ashamed of me. Don't you let yourself be ashamed of Jesus to get somebody else's attention because sometimes that's what happens to us. It's, it's not that we don't want Jesus. It's just that there's some other really nice things out there. And in order to choose Jesus, it's going to mean that we're going to have to maybe not allow people to be impressed with us because we don't want to impress them. It's an extreme choice. When we make this one, it kind of solves all the other ones. If we can just get ourselves out of the way and the things that we want out of the way, it makes all the difference. We can think about what's good for Jesus, that we aren't first, that Jesus is first, and that we're going to honor him. As you look at what he did, he called us to follow him. And he called some of his other disciples as well as well. I want you to look at what happens when sometimes he calls disciples and they leave everything and they follow him. In the 12, we can see that. Some of them he had to call more than once to get them to follow him. And some of them, it seems, he called and they didn't follow. At least they may have thought about it. They may have tried. And that's kind of the passage we see in Luke 9, 57. As they were going along the road, someone said to him, I will follow you wherever you go. And Jesus said to him, Foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man is nowhere to lay his head. And another, he said, Follow me. But he said, Lord, let me first go and bury my father. And Jesus said to him, Leave the dead to bury their own dead. But as for you, go and proclaim the kingdom of God. And yet another said, I will follow you, Lord, but let me first say farewell to those at my home. And Jesus said to him, no one who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is fit for the kingdom of God. And that kind of leaves us wondering, Jesus, did you want disciples or not? 
I mean, you're kind of making this impossible for us, aren't you? You've got three people here who are willing to follow, but you're making it harder for them. And his answer is, yes, I am. Because you're never going to make it if you're doing the compromise. He says, here are, and he gives us some real specific things here. You see, the first thing we've looked at, he says, the main obstacle that stands in our way with Christianity is our self. We've got to get rid of our self. We've got to get rid of the things that we want, what we think should be most important. And, and all those things that are best about us and that everybody likes us and loves us and wants us. And he says, it's not about you anymore. And so to get rid of that's the first thing. The second thing, he says, is you got to get rid of family. Well, that can't be right. Jesus, how is that possible? You can't really be saying that. But if you look at the settings of these three things and what they're dealing with, they're all dealing with things at home. Well, how can that be bad? God is for marriage, right? He's for having kids. He wants us to have good marriages and good kids and be able to raise up good kids and be able to, yeah, all of that. So what is it that he's talking about here? You see, as he gets three people who come to him with all of these things, we can have an allegiance to family that kind of goes way beyond who Jesus is. Because while God invented family and wants family, it's not the main criteria that he has. He says, don't let that become more important than Jesus Christ. And so three disciples come to him. He says, you realize that the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. Disciples are just traveling, walking along with him. Where they stayed, there are some places where we know that they had a place to stay. In some places, they may not have a place to stay. But he says, you're not going to have a place called home. You're not going to have a place of security. You're not going to have a place of safety, a place where you feel like you belong and you know all the neighbors on the block and you know all the gossip that's been going on for the last 10 years and it just feels like home when you get there. He says, you're not going to have that. Now, did the guy leave or not? We're just kind of left with that, is that he says, I'm, I don't have anywhere to call home. I don't have anywhere to lay my head. Well, we don't know, but kind of the assumption is that was too much for him. That was a deal breaker. And if I can't have my place where I fit, where I belong in my country, in my town, in my neighborhood, in my, then he says, no, I want you to lose all of that. The second one he brings is family obligations. I need to bury my father. Okay. Okay. I don't think any of us would object to that. And yet Jesus' response is, let the dead bury the dead. And that seems kind of cruel, seems kind of out of character for Jesus. What are you trying to do, Jesus, that, you know, the guy's dad just died and that, you know, he was on his way to the funeral home, but he stopped by here first? Uh, no, I don't think that's the scenario. I mean, we can come up with all kinds of situations here about how this is. But I think he's at that position, and this is my supposition I'm giving you, where he knows it's about to happen. It hasn't happened yet. You know how we are aware of major changes in our life. Nobody accidentally got married. I mean, you thought about I hope you thought about it. I hope you planned for it. You knew it was going to happen. It doesn't that you just suddenly blurted out to some girl sitting next to you, will you marry me? Oops. We know those things are going to happen. And in the same way, we can understand different stages of life that come. And I think that's where this guy is, is just as soon as this happens, but I've got this going on in my household, in my family, and Jesus says, then you're not ready. 
because there will be people to bury your father. That's not the question. But you follow me. And you need to be where you realize I'm more important than those obligations that we might do. It's not about it getting done. It's about us feeling the family obligation. We don't even realize whether the father has died yet or not. And the third one he brings up is saying goodbye to those at home. Well, that seems simple, doesn't it? Shouldn't we be able to say goodbye and go back and talk to the people that we love and that we care about and be able to say goodbye to them, you know, for a few months? Um, I'm going to be leaving. I'm going on the mission field. I'm going to be traveling a lot for Jesus. I've given my life to Jesus. I'm going to be going, you know, next year sometime. It's not about looking back and going back to where you feel like you're at home. He says, you've got to get past that one. You've got to be able to give that one up. It's not about just saying goodbye to those at home. It's that he's put his emotional life there. And that that's where he lives and that's where he wants to be, really. But I'll follow you, Jesus. He says, no, you've got to put yourself to death. And it isn't that you're denying family or the people at home as if you don't know them anymore, but you cannot act like they're more important than Jesus. It's when that memory pops up on Facebook and it says, nine years ago you used to, you know how you get those? And it'll show you a picture and you have a chance to share it or go back and remember it. I've seen some people that their life is in their in their photo album. Remember the time when. Remember when we did this. Remember this. And there's not much life going on now. It's more about all the times from the past. And so we wanted to say goodbye to those at home. And we keep our emotions there. And Jesus' answer is, the one who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is not fit for the kingdom of God hand to the plow. That's a different one, right? How many of you have ha ever plowed before? Okay, about four, five. <laughs> Me, I have not. I raised my hand, but sorry, that was a lie. I have not plowed before, not with a tractor, not with horses, not with anything. I don't know how to plow. But from what I understand about plowing, you have to hold on to the plow. I imagine this guy with all of the horses that are pulling this thing, if he decides to let go of that thing and take a drink of water or, you know, just take a phone call, uh, there's no telling where he's going to end up. It's got to be straight. You're looking at the other end of the field. You're, you've got to hang on to this because it gets away from you really quick. And that's what he's trying to say is if you started, I don't want you going back and say, oh, well, I need the break. You need the break from, well, I can understand the break from work, but not a break from Jesus. There are times when Jesus took a break from work and said, let's go to the other side of the sea because it had been an especially difficult time. But we don't take a break from Jesus from our following him from us being his disciple. And so he says, no one who puts his hand to the plow, nobody who starts and gets his attention divided, nobody who is not focused on the real mission is fit for the kingdom of God. Wow. This is really hard stuff, isn't it? Do you think he's serious? I'm afraid he is. How can we do both? Keep our life and be a Christian too. And I think the answer is you can't. God wants me to love my family, but he's first. God wants us to take care of people at home, but he's first. And part of the way we take care of people at home is by 
putting him first. So this seems extreme. Why go to this extreme? We have disciples who followed and some who, well, I guess we assume that they didn't. I assume these three guys, even though they came and they were willing and said they wanted to, Jesus basically says, no, you aren't. And I can't use you with that. Why are some accepted and some seem not to be when we look at this? I saw this. Give up defining yourself to yourself and to others. You won't die. In fact, you'll come to life. But when we start defining ourselves as who we think we are and who we need to be and who we think is important and the things that are important to us and not allowing us to be defined by Jesus, of who Jesus is in our life, then we've lost discipleship. That's where identity is, where we identify with Jesus. It's easy to decide which side you're on. I'll be on Jesus' side. These three guys decided that. I'll be on Jesus' side. But no, they didn't, because they didn't know how to live it. It's really difficult when we live there. And it may be as simple as, where do you sit on Sunday morning? Is it in worship? Do you listen to people at church? Have we stopped learning about Jesus? Are we trying to help other people? Are we still reaching out? Are we involved in work that's going on? And I know that's been really difficult. It's almost stopped. We're, what we're able to do other than, you know, being with each other and phone calls and things like that because it's hard to be able to be together. But that's something outside. We don't want to do that from inside. What language do we use? What people do we like to be around? What is it that makes you rejoice? What is it that makes you happy? Where do you like to play? Where is it that you feel best about life and about yourself? And if those things aren't involved with Jesus, if those things are involved with, well, whenever I'm away from here, but I'll be glad to come every once in a while. I think we've kind of missed the point. So let's define ourselves, or let's let Jesus be the one who defines us and not us. In Luke chapter 11 is one of the times when Jesus is challenged about this. He had constant disagreements and arguments with the scribes and Pharisees, and it says in verse 14, now he was casting out a demon that was mute, and when the demon had gone out, the mute man spoke, and the people marveled. And some of them said, he casts out demons by Beelzebul, the prince of demons. While others, to test him, kept seeking from him a sign from heaven. But he, knowing their thoughts, said to them, Every kingdom divided against itself is laid waste, and a divided household falls. But if Satan also is divided against himself, how will they, his kingdom stand? For you say that I cast out demons by Beelzebul. But if I cast out demons by Beelzebul, then by whom do your sons cast them out? Therefore, they will be your judges. But if it is by the finger of God that I cast out demons, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. When a strong man fully armed guards his own place, his goods are safe. But when one stronger than he attacks him and overcomes him, he takes away his armor in which he trusted and divides his spoil. Whoever is not with me is against me. And whoever does not gather with me scatters. Wow. What an amazing thing to be able to cast out a demon. Wouldn't that be something? I don't think I'd want to mess with a guy who's able to cast out a demon. I mean, I don't know if they could see the demon on the guy or, you know, does he have that deep voice? I am Legion. You know, some kind of voice like this. And, you know, that's what we always see in the movies is something like that. Does he look all ugly and red and everything? I doubt he has the pitchfork with him. But anyway, that 
somehow he looks demon-like and, you know, he's able to deal with somebody like this and you realize the kind of power he has. And the Pharisees and scribes here had argued with Jesus so much because they didn't like what he was saying. They didn't like what he was doing because they weren't, he was not giving them all the credit. They were the people that were religious they had this thing down. They had everyone doing exactly what they thought until Jesus comes along and he messes everything up because he has a different way of looking at the Word of God and he seems to deal with people a lot more and he seems to bring God into their life a lot more than, than what the scribes and Pharisees had. And they were on the same side. They're doing the same thing the same way and yet it seems like they are worse enemies than anyone else. Why is that? Jesus is very intense about following God. And he's not afraid to disagree with them. And he's not afraid to tell them they're wrong. And yeah, they have some of the wrong concepts and some of the wrong doctrines. And they do argue a lot. They looked like people who were religious. And Jesus did not. But yet people were following Jesus. And it made them crazy. How can we have this? How can we have this other guy, this simple guy who everyone listens to and not to us? And so they start talking bad about Jesus. He's casting out demons by the devil himself. Jesus says, that makes no sense at all. See, when we say bad things, it makes us look bad. And they just look foolish when they start to say something like that. He says, every kingdom that's divided itself is going to fall. Satan is smarter than this. He's not going to cast out his own demons when they're in there doing good demon work. I don't know what demons do, actually, other than control somebody to do evil things. And, and he says, they're doing all of this, but... He says, you've got to realize that God comes and, and he throws them out and they don't know what else to say. And so they start accusing him of being in, le in league with the devil. Every kingdom divided against itself falls. Satan is highly organized. He would not do that. It's never just one little temptation or one little thing that happens. It's always he is highly organized. It's never just this once. He knows everything about you, and his attack on us is very coordinated. And if Jesus casts out demons by God, then the kingdom has come. And so he talks about the strong man, right? Right? That's who we want to be. He guards his place. He's fully armed. His goods are safe because he is the strong man. He has the armor and he has the weapons in which he trusts. And he knows that he's able to protect and he knows he's able to defend. Uh, but what does Satan do? He says, when you find someone who is stronger and he comes and he takes away the things that make him strong, take away his weapons, take away his armor, take away the things that he believes and stands for, then Satan can come and do anything he wants. And so don't let anyone take away your weapons. That's maybe one of the first things we have to realize. Be the strong man. Have the weapons. Make yourself safe. What are the weapons? Well, do you feel strong this morning? Do you feel good? Do you feel like you've got this? Or maybe that's why you came here is to know about the weapons and what do we have? Well, there's great graphics about this. What I'm going to tell you is that here's your weapons. Truth, righteousness, a gospel, faith, salvation, and the word of God. Does that seem strong? I wanted something that blows up, didn't you? I mean, there's got to be a fuse in it somewhere. Something heavy that you have to swing or carry or do something. You know, there's it, nothing shoots. It's just 
He says, no, those are your weapons. And in Ephesians 6, when he talks about it as armor, he puts it this way. It's the belt of truth, the breastplate of righteousness, the feet that have the gospel of peace. It's the shield of faith. It's the helmet of salvation. It's the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. He says, don't lose your weapons. But it, see, it makes more sense when you say belt, breastplate, shoes, shield, helmet, sword. Those sound better than when we say truth, righteousness, gospel, faith, salvation, and word. Why does one sound stronger than the other? Maybe it's because we don't know how to use them. Maybe it's because we don't realize how strong they are. Maybe it's because they haven't really made a difference in our life. Truth is powerful. That we are truthful, that we are honest, that we are righteous. Righteousness is huge. Don't discount that. The gospel is huge. It's the gospel of peace as he describes it here. It's faith, it's salvation, your confidence, your knowledge of your salvation and that you have this from God, your understanding of the Word of God. It's like the Spirit is able to use it as a sword with how much you know about the Word of God. And that's what he begins to describe here. Don't lose your weapons. You need to know how to use those weapons. Be true as righteous people who have a gospel that we believe and that we are able to share because we know about our own salvation. We know how to use those weapons, and nobody's going to come destroy that. And then Jesus says, whoever is not with me is against me. We all work together. We are all together. The one who doesn't gather with me scatters. He's with me. He's working with me. He's here with me. And all of these things talk about Jesus and the guy who is with him. He's part of the group. He's part of the people that he knows. He's part of the others that are around. It's not that there were some disciples that were off. I, I think we think of it as only the 12, but there were more people than that. And especially we know this as we look at the resurrection. All of a sudden, there's 120. Well, where'd you get 120? Well, they were around. They were there. There's the 72 that were sent out. Well, who's the 72? Well, they were people that he sent out that had all of these weapons that are now able to go, able to preach, able to tell people about God. And then there's the 500, and we're like, wait a second, there's lots of these people. And they were all involved with Jesus, whether we see them in the story or not. And so he says, the one who is not with me is against me. The one who goes off on his own, trying to tell everybody how to be good. But that's not the way to do it. It's more what we have with Jesus that makes all the difference. Pharisees were supposed to be on the same side. They were supposed to be with Jesus. They are the religious people looking for their Messiah. They have a heritage. They have a promise. And they declare it is not Jesus. And they did everything they could to stop him. He says, you can't have that. No wonder it seems like Satan gets so strong sometimes when we get religious people who think that they are doing things the right way, but who end up fighting against each other because it destroys everything. It destroys the work. No kingdom that is divided will stand. And so we need to not sabotage our own work. We need to be at least as organized as Satan is. No, we need to be much better. He's given you the tools. He's given you the weapons. The disciples are going to say in Luke 9, I don't know if you remember this back in verse 50, that they saw somebody who wasn't part of our group and he was casting out demons and we tried to stop him. Jesus is like, don't try to stop him if he's casting out demons. 
That means he's on our side. And so sometimes we want to make dividing lines between us and say, well, you're not part of us because you think this. And sometimes we divide things way too much. It's the one who is with us that makes all the difference. And so choose Jesus. That's the main thing. That's the important thing. In Luke chapter 11, he talks about this idea of having a light. He says, no one after lighting a lamp puts it in a cellar or under a basket, but on a stand so that those who enter may see the light. Your eye is the lamp of your body. And when your eye is healthy, your whole body is full of light. But when it is bad, your whole body is full of darkness. Therefore, be careful lest the light in you be darkness. And if then your whole body is full of light, having no dark part, it will be wholly bright as when a lamp with its rays gives you light. And so he says, light a lamp. We are to be that lamp. We are to be that light. God wants us on fire. God wants us to be the ones who choose Jesus and let Jesus shine through us. Our eye is the lamp of the body and the things that we think and the way in which we live and the language that we use and the attitude that we get is to show Jesus. Well, what if our attitude's bad? You know, we just got up grouchy this morning and we came here and it's awful and it's terrible and everything we see in life is bad and then we don't know the weapons we've got about faith and righteousness and those things you're able to change because that's when you die to self, to that kind of person, and you live for Jesus Christ. And so when your body is full of light, that's what he tries to describe here. Your whole body is full of light. Your thinking is right, and we're up for the challenge of what comes next. When you know where you're supposed to sit on Sunday morning. I don't know, I don't mean which pew. The ones with blue tape, right? But somebody else gets there first because it's starting to get a little crowded now with the blue tape, and so that gets harder. No, it's that you sit in the presence of God on Sunday morning, and that's what you choose. That's where you sit, and that your attitude is an attitude of praise, and that the fruit that comes out of our life is the love and the joy and the peace and the patience and the kindness and the self-control, and that we have our armor, we have this salvation, the gospel to tell, and truth and righteousness on our side, and we have the word of God. So then we can be the strong men. We can be the ones who have decided to live for Jesus, and we can be here to help others. So today, have you chosen Jesus? If you didn't make that choice, then that's why we're here, to be part with this, to be here to help you, to be here to pray with you. If there's anything we can do to make that all come about, would you come while we stand and sing?